What does he mean by that? And uh, I'll tell you what I mean. Uh, but let me tell you a story first. Um, when I got out of the Marine Corps in the uh, August 13th, 1971, I was uh, just turned 22 years old. And uh, I needed a job. So uh, I, I did go and apply for unemployment in Florida and got unemployment uh, payments. And I met a guy named Daryl Hardison. And Daryl Hardison was an independent broker, insurance broker. And uh, he actually, one of the companies he carried was Preferred Risk. And he said, I can get you a job as a salesman with Preferred Risk. So I drove over to Orlando from Titusville. I drove over to Orlando and took the test that evaluates whether you can sell insurance or not. And, uh, and so the results came back, and I went to his office, and he said, well, he said, let me explain something. <laughs> he, said, he said, the test says don't even try to sell insurance. <laughs> but I've learned those tests, they don't know. You know, you just, you, you just, you just, you can do this. Okay, but there's not going to be a guarantee. There's not going to be a draw. There's not going to be just, just what I sell is what I get. So, uh, in insurance, what I learned was you have to create a need. Now, uh, you, uh, I'm hungry right now. You don't have to create a need for lunch for me because... I'm going to go buy lunch somewhere when I leave here. Um, and, and there are lots of things where you don't have to create a need. The need's there, right? But insurance, and here I am 21 years old, so who's, who's my main clientele? Well, people my age, young people. Well, now young people, 22, 23, 24 years old, mid, mid-20s, mid-30s, they're not going to die, and they know it. They're invincible. Not, not going to, old people are dying, not young people. And so I think he overestimated my clientele because I'd, I'd go and, uh, uh, number one, the, the presumptive close was something that I just couldn't do. I don't like to see people squirm. That's where you just go through the whole thing and then you say there's plan A and plan B. Yeah, we've got to do plans. Then you ask them, so which plan do you think better suits you that's all you ask them, their opinion, opinion about a plan. And they said, well, I think if I was going, you know, probably, probably, probably be, you know, and make them pick a plan. And then you just start writing out the contract. <laughs> and they're thinking, you know, he came in, he's a really nice guy, he likes, my, he likes my family, he likes my dog, he likes my car, he likes everything. And I've said something that makes him think that I'm buying this. And I don't want to interrupt him. I don't want to be rude. So 15 minutes later, you fill out his long application. Say, give me a check for $25. Back then, I was back when $25 was $25. That's 71 And uh, uh, I, 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 just couldn't, I just couldn't do that. I just couldn't do that. I come to the end of my presentation. I say, so you want to buy it? <laughs> and the answer was always no except for once. I sold one policy. I made $30 in four months of selling insurance. <laughs> and my problem was I could not create a need in their minds. I couldn't do it. I couldn't convince the mid-20 guy that he was going to die. He didn't think he was going to die. Now me, I think about dying every day. Sorry about that. I just do. You know, I, it didn't happen yesterday. It hadn't happened so far today. But... And I'm working hard, you know, to, to, to go in the rapture. I'm working hard. But uh, anyway, uh, young people, I just couldn't create the need. Well, some things there's a, a built-in need for. You don't have to create a need. People realize they need things. Eternal life is something that people don't necessarily grasp. Oh, I need eternal life. Especially young people, same problem. Uh, they don't really need... As far as they're concerned, they don't think they need anything. Now, I show you this house because I've been following this house now on Zillow for three and a half months. 
It's that, uh, see the yellow area? That's Las Vegas, Nevada. And notice, for those of you that are from there, I said Nevada. Okay, yeah, okay. And uh, actually, it's only Lou and Minnie from there, so I just want to show them on you how to pronounce it. All right, that's, uh, that's 3970 Spencer Street, and there's, oh, didn't mean to do that. Let's go back. Well, that's good time. Yeah. All right, that's, uh, that's the strip there. Look at there, two and a half miles from the strip. I mean, it's nice. That's a child facility, a child government facility right there. It's, it's close to lots of stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look down, all these houses, they all got pools. Nice houses. But no, this is a big lot right here. Big lot. Now you think, why in the world is he following that house? That's the house. Berkshire Hathaway has, has that house listed. Now, in 2018, the taxes on it were only $7,700. But they want, no, no a year. Yeah. But they want $18 million. Ber, uh, Berkshire Hathaway. And there's a five beds, six baths, 2,300 square feet. It's been on the market for three and a half months. Nobody's bought it. Um. But there's one thing that's really unique about this house. I mean, really, really, more than location. I mean, it's two and a half miles from the strip. Did I mention that? More than location, and it is this. It has a killer basement. <laughs> it has a 15,200 square foot basement, 26 feet under the ground, that is decked out. That's the house that's 5,000 square feet underneath. That's what it looks like from that angle. They got murals on all the walls to make it look like you're outside and lighting that makes it look, uh, got a pool. That's all underground right there. And, and that's what it looks like at night. Of course, it could, it's not whatever you want it to be night. And uh, uh, it's, 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 it's a cool house, right? But they still can't sell it. Uh, I mean, beautiful house. I mean, wouldn't you love to live 26 feet under the ground in that? What would make this house sell? I mean, really. What would make this house sell? That would do it. Uh, I called my dad last night, and my dad's 90, and uh, uh, Ben's 90. Ben's a little older than my dad. Um, no, actually, my dad's three months older than Ben. But uh, so, uh, so I called my dad last night, and I said, so who was that couple um, 60 years ago? that you and mom used to play cards with that got scared in 1962 and built their own bomb shelter. It wasn't, it wasn't, no, but it was, it was, built their own bomb shelter. And uh, so, so we're going back and forth, he can't remember, and finally I said, Colleen, Colleen. And he said, yeah, Colleen. So we talked a while longer about something else, and then he says, Carl. Carl and Colleen. And they were trying to get the last name. We can't get it. And I'm saying, and you know, I hadn't thought about these people in years. And it just popped it. Mine's a funny thing. Atwood. And he said, that's it. Carl and Colleen Atwood built a bomb shelter because remember 1962? I went to school that day in October and I thought that might be the end of our world that day. I mean, really, all of us, it was solemn on the bus that morning. We were nearly cutting up, but that morning we thought this could be it. Khrushchev was ready, and John Kennedy was ready, and whoa, they had missiles aimed at us from Cuba, and we were worried about that. Well, I'll tell you what, that house, there are a lot of people going to pay $18 million for that house if, if suddenly uh, Kim, whatever his name, <laughs> A need, a need, and 
it's always going to be, it's always going to be about the need. So my question is this, got eternal life? Remember the got milk? Got eternal life? Well, as you get older, you think more about eternal life. Younger people, they don't think so much. Because as far as they're concerned, it can last forever. You know, the, um, the thing about eternal life is it depends on a belief in a creator. And that, by the way, is diminishing every year. And I, I read a lot of articles, and I only stand, understand about 20% of the articles about evolution. But the 20% that I read shows me this, that the evolutionists are all over the board on how it took place. And they have contradictory opinions about what took place when, yet under the big global, uh, uh, the, the, the big canopy of... Uh, of evolution, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we believe in evolution. Well, what do you believe about evolution? All over the board on it. Well, eternal life assumes, and I assume this from reading my scripture, that when I die, that there are two places, either heaven, which I prefer, or hell, which I have a strong, strong, strong preference against. And, and by the way, you know, the fact that everybody, you know, when you dismiss a creator, when you dismiss as complex as our bodies are, you can talk to an evolution and say, so all of this just came into being and evolved. That's right. Well, how about my Apple Watch? Could I, could, could that possibly evolve and just, well, no. What? You mean all of this, my body, everything was happenstance? But the watch had to be man-made. It's tiny. You can't evolve a watch? Really, to the rational mind, it, it makes no sense. And once you are able to accept that there's a creator... Then you realize that, well, there's life after death then because our Creator in the Word of God said, yes, there is life after death. And there's got to be a distinction. I mean, I mean, if Hitler ends up the same place with us, we're saying there's something wrong here. Am I right? Something wrong. Um, I asked Grant what the biggest thing on the a uh, trip he made with his class to Washington, D.C., and then went to the Holocaust Museum, and he showed me some, some pictures on his phone. Horrible, horrible, horrible. You mean to tell me that Hitler could possibly have the same afterlife as... No. So there is a distinction of some sort. There is some determining factor that determines whether a person goes to heaven or whether a person goes to an eternity in hell. And that we're told in the authoritative book that we have, the Word of God, that that is accepting Jesus Christ as Savior. Can somebody please guarantee me life after death? Yes, they can. And that person was Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall Never die. He was talking about uh, the fact that he could resurrect himself from the grave. This is, by the way, the occasion where Jesus brings Lazarus out of the tomb. And this was just six days. This was a few days. Uh, more than six. But a few days. The party was six days uh, before, the before the crucifixion. But this is a, a, a few days. A couple weeks maybe. Uh, before the uh, crucifixion and he resurrects Lazarus from the tomb, been dead four days. And, uh, and they suggested, well, he stinks. You know, don't, don't bring this guy out. You know, do something. But, ah, he stinks because he's been dead four days. 
Jesus intentionally didn't go there when he heard that Lazarus was just sick. He waited for Lazarus to die before he showed up, before he even left. And he'd been dead for four days. And the scripture on that chapter 11 is really, really funny. When he came out in his grave clothes, had to be hopping, you know, thing over his face. He'd raised from the dead. Uh, it was such a problem that the Pharisees and the Sadducees said, you know what, uh, we might want to consider killing Lazarus. I'd be afraid to try to kill a guy that just been resurrected from the grave. <laughs> Somebody won't stay dead. It's not good luck to try to keep killing him. <laughs> but they honestly, they consider, you know, this resurrection, is, this, is not, this is not good for us. Now, people everywhere try to diminish Jesus. I mean, whoever thought in the United States of America that our faith, our Christian faith, would be under such assault as it is? It is unbelievable. It's amazing that, that it's happening. And, and the reason is because there's less and less and less regard for the Bible. But you know, the thing about it is this. The disciples... They were skeptical about the possibility that Jesus would arise from the tomb. His own disciples had been with him for three and a half years. And they were skeptical. They were thinking, ah, oh, this is it. This is the end. Now, I can show you that in Scripture. I didn't just make that up. Before the crucifixion, Jesus is meeting with them the night before. And he says, after I've been raised, I will go before for you into Galilee. Now Galilee, by the way, is way up in northern Israel. Uh, it takes it takes ninety minutes in an automobile to drive from Jerusalem to Galilee. I mean, it's it's a trip. Um, got stopped by a young lady who was flashing her lights, pulled me over. But I didn't get a ticket. It was, she, she couldn't understand me and I couldn't understand her, but I figured it out. But when I left the gas station, I took my phone and I set it up on the dash and she saw me. And she pulled me over for holding my phone while I was driving. So, I, whoa. You know, uh. But uh, Jesus told them, he said, I want you to go meet me up in Galilee. And after the resurrection, uh, the angel sees Mary Magdalene and says, Go quickly and tell his disciple that he's risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And then as Mary's on the way to tell them, Jesus uh, intercepts her and says himself to Mary Magdalene, do not be afraid. Go tell the disciples. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So you know what they did? They didn't go. They did not go. So how is that for believing? You know, you pick out 11 good men. No, you got one stinker. All right. You pick out 11 good men. You preach them. You teach them. And then you tell them what to do, and they don't do it. Sometimes it's hard to get good help. <laughs> they didn't believe. As a matter of fact, in Mark 16, 14, later he appeared to the eleven, as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief. It took me a while to figure out what that meant, because it doesn't specify. Well, what that means is he's meeting them there in Jerusalem because they wouldn't go to Galilee. They just wouldn't do it. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Their unbelief. So the resurrection was actually a little bit hard to wrap their brains around, even his own disciples after it happened. Resurrected from the grave. They even went to the tomb and saw the grave was empty. Still didn't believe. Jesus appeared to the eleven twice. The second time, we're not told where it was, but I'm betting the second time was up in Galilee. 
And a third time, Jesus meets them in John 21, and he tells Peter, he said, Peter, here's what I want you to do. I want you to feed my sheep. So did Peter learn his lesson? Well, look at him. When I say don't squander the resurrection, here's a guy that after that day, he never squandered the resurrection again. Because he gets up before the people that have Jewish leaders there, these same people who had put Jesus on a cross. And he stands up to preach to them and he says, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life whom, by the way, God raised from the dead. And we saw it, we saw it all. We're witnesses. So, the deal is, here's Peter. He said, you know, the resurrection turns out to be the big deal. I mean, the big deal. The big deal is Jesus arose from the grave. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There was that crucifixion thing. We were all really, really sad. And for three days we mourned. And we thought it was over. But then, Jesus comes out of the tomb. And when Mary and, and told us about it, well, we thought, yeah, nah, I don't think so. But once we realize, once we've met with Jesus and we've seen that it's Him, hey, this resurrection is a really big thing. This resurrection sets us apart from well, away from Judaism, this sets us apart from every other religion. A resurrection from the grave. So then uh, Peter has this uh, next occasion, and it's over in chapter 4. In chapter 4, Peter is called in on the carpet. Well, the Sanhedrin, they really had stone floors. And... Uh, Peter's got his opportunity. These are the very people who crucified Jesus. I mean, the very people. And so they say, uh, heard you've been preaching. Explain to us what you've been doing. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man that healed the man, at the temple, they have been uh, crippled from birth. By what means he has been made well, let it be known to you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. No, oh, Peter, he recognizes the value of the resurrection here. He says, wow, this, this really is, really, really is a big deal. When Peter gets up to the Gentiles, up to this point had just been Jews and Samaritans in chapter 8. When Peter gets to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are a bunch of pagans, a bunch of heathens that, that uh, their, their religion was debauchery. I mean, just hedonism. And Cornelius the centurion, who could have had Peter killed any time he wanted to, he had the authority, but he calls for Peter. Peter goes up and preaches. And Peter says this, We're witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen by God, even to us who, are ate, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. It's about the resurrection. Peter knew it's about the resurrection. If you're going to set yourself apart, if you're going to say why our God is different, if you're going to explain why Jesus Christ is our Savior, understand this. It's about the resurrection. Don't squander the resurrection. That's what makes us different. Oh yeah, people get talking about, oh yeah, ours is, you know, yeah, we love one another and we fellowship and we do this and we have potluck dinners and, you know, it's all about, okay, yeah, we do all that. But the big deal is it's about the resurrection. I mean, that's the big deal. 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 13, Paul takes over. And Paul preaches the resurrection of the synagogue, the synagogue right there among the Jews, right there in Antioch of Pisidia. He preaches the resurrection. In Acts chapter 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica. He enters the synagogue and he preaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. In Acts chapter 26, Paul is called in before King Agrippa. And Paul, before King Agrippa, he says, look here. The Jews had me arrested. Here I am standing before you. And let me explain a reality that I cannot deny, I cannot take back. It is what it is. Jesus rose from the dead. What are you going to do about that? It is what it is. And that's when King Agrippa said, almost, almost you persuade me to be a Christian. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that's what makes us unique. You know, we all got unique qualities. But what makes our faith unique? Buddha's dead. There is no other religion that I can think of that has a risen Savior. And think about it for just a moment. If, uh, if you're going to tell me that I need to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior because He can give me eternal life, I need to believe that He has the power to restore eternal life. If, uh, if I told you, uh, if you'll give me six months, I can teach you to play as good as Mary. <laughs> now, the first thing you're going to be saying is, you know, Wayne. <laughs> can you play the piano? <laughs> And if I say, maybe, <laughs> never tried, don't know. <laughs> if, if you don't believe that I have power over that piano, you're not going to come take lessons from me. Now, uh, I taught my son to play racquetball, and in six months he's beating my brains out. <laughs> but I've been playing all my life. But... Here's the deal. You, you have to have something that shows that you've got the power to do what you say you can do. Jesus rose Lazarus out of the grave, out of the tomb, and then a few days later, Jesus resurrects himself out of the grave. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, right after this passage right here, he says, He was seen above 500 witnesses saw Jesus Christ after he came out of the grave. And then we have Paul explaining, explaining how important the resurrection is. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you were saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Here's what Paul's saying. The gospel message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Don't squander the resurrection. That is what sets us apart as unique as Christians. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I know we don't we don't talk about it constantly, but perhaps we should. That is what makes the difference. There's kindness in all religions. And there's meanness in all religions. But there's faith and trust and love when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But that faith comes from the fact that Jesus Christ raised Lazarus, raised himself, and promises 
to us that he's the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's a great promise. That's why I say don't squander the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is what makes us special. Let's stand, please.